starting a new series today, and it's called Core. And it's going to deal with our core values and vision of who we are. About once a year, I'll usually take some time to stop and just teach these values because your core values are what guide you, what keep you on the right path. It's the glue that keeps you together. Core values never change. Methods do change. But your core values will never change. And so as we look at these over the next few weeks, you're going to, especially if you're new, you're going to get a great, great understanding of the journey we want to lead you on, help you grow spiritually, let you know what our main values are to understand that everything we do here, those will always stay in place, but the way you communicate them is going to change. So you always focus on the value and the core, not necessarily the methods methods have to change. We live in a different culture. What's interesting is I taught this message nine years ago, and this message is more relevant today than it was even nine years ago. That is how quickly our culture is changing and the way uh, life is happening in this world today. We are post-Christian culture now. First time in history, we are no longer considered a Christian culture. When people look at church nowadays, this younger generation, they know nothing about it. They view it as an event, just like going bowling or to a football game. They go and wanting to seek and find answers. And the thing is, is that just generation, most of them don't come because they don't see value in going. That is why we do everything we can to make Sunday the best thing that happens in your life all week. Because there has to be, in this generation, people go to Disney because they see value in Mickey ears. I'm just saying. But church has to have answers. It has to have values. It has to teach how to live your life. People are looking, how do you live? Where are answers found? Because they're finding you... You, you're finding out everything on the internet isn't true. And you're not, all your answers aren't going to be there. But God does have all your answers. Amen. But this generation has to be shown that. And they have to experience that. So we have five core values that we stand by. Today I'm going to talk about mi casa su casa. My house is your house and what that means. But when it looks in, when we come to, to the core, and when it comes to even in our natural life, if you've ever gone to a trainer, you've ever, you know, gone to start a, um, you know, January 1st is coming up, half of you are going to join a gym and never use it. It's going to be awesome. And they'll talk about your core and strengthening your core. And this is why usually once a year I'll talk about our core values because just in the natural, there's great benefits to strengthening your core. And if I asked in this room how many of you have been working out and strengthening your core, I know every hand would go up. Yep, that's what I thought would happen. Because you know what happened last service? Not one hand went up. So we'll just... But in the natural, it's important we strengthen our core. It's amazing how sick and unhealthy we are because our core as Americans aren't healthy. One of our head ushers here is a chiropractor, Dr. Steve, and I sent him a text and I said to him, hey, just give me some benefits of core. And so he wrote all these things out, how it helps your posture, your health, your balance, all these different things. Because I just wanted to throw some things out there. So between him and some things I found on the internet, this is what they'll tell you when you strengthen your core. And if it works naturally, this is why I'm talking about it as a church. That all of us understand our core values. Because naturally, when you strengthen your core, it teaches your muscles to work together. Do you know how a church is effective? By working together by its core values. Number two that you'll see is this. It brings balance and stability to the body and it brings its strength because you're talking one vision, one heart, one purpose as the Bible Bible says. 
Another thing it does is this, is that it lessens the risk of falling. Do you know how many people fall out of church and fall out of Christianity because they have no core beliefs and values? Too many. It lessens, it it helps the efficiency of the body. Another thing it does is, I like this, it aids in the prevention of injuries. When you are strong spiritually, it will help you fight the enemy and what he tries to do. And understanding that, and I've done some great series this year along those lines of understanding how we fight by the armor of God and what that means. You can go online and look at that. So it opens, it brings me to this opening, and that is this statement. Our loyalty to our future must be greater than our loyalty to the past. That is true in every area of your life. The Apostle Paul put it this way in the book of Philippians. He said, forgetting those things which are behind, what happened is done. I press towards the high calling. I keep my eyes on Jesus, as we just have sung. Because in your marriage relationship, if you only focus on what should have done, or what should have happened, or what they did do or didn't do, your marriage is going nowhere. You're always living in the past. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the Bible says, the evidence of things not seen. The Bible tells us that Abraham spoke faith. He spoke those things before he ever saw them come to pass in his life. God had promised him a child, and it took 25 years, but it says... Abraham kept that before him, and he's the father of our faith that he believed God, he trusted God, even when his wife chuckled and laughed about it and said, are you kidding me? I'm 90 years old. No, that's quite a feat, having a baby that old, amen? And God, and you have to speak Faith, you have to be more committed to where you want to go than continuing to be thinking about your past. This is why values are so important, and this is why 94% of churches in America aren't growing and the denominations are shrinking, is because they're more loyal to the methods of the past than they are what's happening in the culture today. They could have kept the same message, but they didn't change their methods. And they're not growing. Methods have to adjust. Give you an example of lasagna. My wife is an incredible cook. I'm very blessed to have a wife that knows how to, how to do those things. I can grill. That's about as far as my cooking techniques go is right there. I can make macaroni and cheese. Anyways... So, from a box. (laughs) Craft. (laughs) Half a stick of butter. Quarter cup of milk. I can do that. I'm good. Okay, I got that. She makes this macaroni and cheese truly to die for at holidays. And it's all these cheeses and different things. I'd be like, man, I'd kill that thing. I would burn it up. I wouldn't know how to do it. I'd throw Velveeta in. That's all you need, Velveeta. Melt it, boom, call it good. But, you know, think of this illustration. Think of lasagna. You know, my wife is going to make lasagna for our family. And it's like, you know, famous cooks want it. Just saying. And, um, and let's go with, go with my illustration here. And so she's making this world-renowned lasagna for us. Well, she's going to come home, and she pretty much can do all of it. You know, there's five or six, well, there's more of us now, but just say you have a family of five, and she starts making this lasagna. She makes it in a certain size pan, and she decorates the table all nice and gets it all ready for us and makes this great lasagna. You know, she can do that. Well, then she decides, you know what, let's have our staff over. Well, our staff and, uh, and family members, you know, that's, it could be well over 30 with that. And, and all of a sudden now, she can't do it and serve it and make it the same way. Now, the ingredients in the lasagna, that doesn't change. That's only made one way. 
But now she's got to use bigger pans. She's got to get people to help deliver it. She's got to, you know, serve it and cut it. And now she can't do everything. She can make it, but now she needs involvement from all the family and people and helping to get it to the tables to cut it and deliver it. And now everything changes except the ingredients of it. That's the same. Now she gets adventurous, and she's like, you know what? I want to serve it for all over 400 workers in the church. (laughs) She just fainted. You didn't see her? I need an EMS. Help her. Well, guess what? She is going to be singly focused and consumed in that. All these other things are going to probably be happening. The tables might not be getting set up. That's not going to happen. This is going to happen. But the lasagna and the value of it and the ingredients never changes. But now on this scale, everything's got to change, even from our home and then even having the staff and then even how it changed from just our family. But that lasagna recipe never changed. Our core values and what we believe from the Bible will not change. But everything else has to as we grow. The methods, how things are communicated, the way they're communicated. And that's why when I preached this message nine years ago and I started looking at this, I'm like, I need to bring this message out again on generations. And how important it is that every single generation works together in the church of God. For the first time in history, there are five generations in the workplace. And for a business to be effective, all of them have to learn to work together. The same is true in a church. All five generations have to work together if we're going to reach this city and reach this world. That's why when our big outreach, our first Christmas, white Christmas comes up here in December, when we bring in the ice skating rink and we're bringing in the snow hill and we're having the four services and having our big special Sunday with our music, we want to reach this city. We want to let the community know that, you know what, church is fun, it's interesting, and you can come and find the answers to Christianity But you got to remember the unchurched look at this as just another event. So why would they come? We need to be the method. People just don't show up Sundays like they used to. They just don't. We live in a post-Christian culture. So what's interesting is December now has become... It's becoming our big outreach month to our community. One of the things that we're doing is, and we've already done it, is this summer we we filled 500 boxes full of toys for Christmas we sent to Guatemala. And we have 12 people. Jim, how many are going? 12? Is it 12? 12 people, around 12 people are going to Guatemala. They're going to join up with probably about 40 other people church members from across the country, and they're going to distribute thousands of boxes to little villages and towns throughout all of Guatemala, and they're going to use that as a way to get people to Christ. I think last, last year, how many? 4,000? No. 20? 5,700 boxes went out. How many people got saved again? Was it a couple thousand? It was a couple thousand people gave their life to the Lord through that outreach. Incredible. My wife and I, and oh, let me, I'll come back to that in a second. Let me talk, remind me about Guatemala, come back to that. And then for the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years, we've been helping Salvation Army, and we've been partnering with them to bring Christmas to those that are less fortunate. They don't have anything for Christmas. And so what we ask you to do this time of year is don't eat out as much, don't go to McDonald's as much, save your money. And then as a church, we all go to Walmart together after service. And then we take the money that we have, whatever you're capable of doing, whether you can buy one toy or 10 toys, 
We just ask to show up and let's help the poor and do something. So in December, we're helping the poor. We're going into the world and we're offering an opportunity for people to come to our services and find freedom through Jesus Christ who wouldn't come, but you're going to invite them to come to be on an ice skating rink in a snow hill. They're going to have fun, but they're also going to find the answers to what they're looking for and need. And that's Jesus Christ. But that takes all of us to work together to use our gifts to serve and to help and for an hour come to service and be here when your friends come, but then serve and make it a great time for people to have a white Christmas and enjoy it and to bless all what you guys have done this year in your giving and serving and have a fun day with together as a community and as a family and be able to worship Jesus and lift his name up. Jesus healed and fed them. People came. He used things naturally also to get to be able to preach the gospel. And so when you look at community, when you look at generations, if we have five generations working side by side, it's essential for the growth of the church world and this church that generations work together. Because here's the thing, for the success of churches, we gotta realize this, every generation has its strengths but every generation has its weaknesses. And the way we are going to reach the world is coming together with our strengths, learn to work with each other's weaknesses so we can get the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. So the key is this, generational understanding, balance, and involvement. That is how the church world and this church is going to grow, is understanding there has to be a generational balance and involvement. Mi casa, su casa, this is how our value is. This is our first value, our core value. Now, not in order. We just have five. They can go in any order, but this is the first one I'm talking about. And it's mi casa, su casa, and this is how we define it. My house is your house. No matter your generation, culture, ethnic background, marital status, or age, you're welcome here. Our church is a reflection of the diversity that surrounds us. You look at this church and you watch everything. See, people, when they see themselves walking through the doors, they feel welcomed. They feel welcomed. That's why whether you can play an instrument, whether you can sing, whether you can park a car, whether you're helping children's, whatever it is, when people come and they can see themselves represented there, it's like, I'm welcome here. And not only that, but, you know, we need the involvement just like I, isn't it our bass player just got shingles? I, I just got shingles in July. That's no fun. You know, but where's the bass player? He had shingles. But guess what? I know some of you guys, you're old rockers out there. You should be up here playing. Come on. Yeah. We'll let you even grow the beard like it was back with Zizi, you know? I don't want to ask which bands you all listen to. But anyways, every generation has a strength and a weakness and has to be involved as we move forward. Psalms 89 tells us the contemplation of Ethan the Ezraite says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. See, it's fascinating to me the end of the Old Testament ends with generational divide. There was a generational gap. Something happened. I don't know what it was, but you know what? I think it's always been. Malachi ends with these words, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, 
And he will return the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers as I come and strike the earth with the curse. This was 400 years before John the Baptist, 400 years of silence, of God not speaking. But there was definitely some type of divide or gap between generations for this to be written this way where God wants the generations to work together. He wants them to work together. And the sad thing about it is Satan's number one tool is to divide generations and to divide the church and to divide different groups. It's never changed. In the Bible, there was racial division. The Jewish Christians didn't like the Gentile Christians. They fought between each other. There's always been a gender division of male and female. Not only that, but to even in this day, there's doctrinal differences. Do we dunk or do we sprinkle? I got sprinkled. Well, I got dunked. There's differences in the rapture opinion, post, pre, or mid. Well, I believe, I believe in post-tribulation rapture. That's fine. I don't. I believe in pre-tribulation when all the world is falling apart and judgment's being poured out, can I tell you what? I'm on that first plane right out of here. If you all want to stay, feed my dogs. <laughs> take care of them while I'm gone, okay? Go to my house, take care of little Posh and Parker for me. But I believe, but you can believe whatever you want. The matter is, is that do you believe in Jesus Christ? And there's core things you don't budge on. Salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. Amen? But you see all this stuff always going on through humanity. Not only that, but one of the most significant barriers facing to us today is the generational separation. Oh, the horrible millennials. And this and that. It, it, listen to these statements, okay? Okay? The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders, love to chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their homes, in the, helping in their homes. They are no longer rise when the elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, talk before company, and gobble up all the pastries at the table and tyrannize their teachers. Come on, teachers, amen on that one there, all right? You know who said that? That was attributed to Socrates by Plato. Now, that was a little while ago, everybody. How about this one? The world is passing through troublous times. The young people today think of nothing but themselves. They have no reverence for parents or old age. They're impatient. Uh, I'm, they're impatient patient of all restraint. They talk as if they know everything. And what passes for wisdom with us is foolishness with them. As for the girls, they're forward, immodest, and unladylike in speech, behavior, and dress. This was a sermon preached by Peter the Hermit in 1274. How many know it's never changed? It's always been an issue, just as Satan has never changed, and he's always tried to take weaknesses and get people fighting and dividing each other because that's where he's strong. That's where he wins. But let me tell you what we need. We need the energy and the idealism of the younger generation. If we didn't have them, none of us would be looking at this screen we would pull out the old flannel boards and the old projectors. You know, remember those old projectors you put up on a screen? Handwritten, what were those things called? Whatever, projectors. <laughs> and none, all of us that are older, and I can say that I'm past 50. All of us that are older, none of us would know how to use our cell phones. 
How do you turn this thing on? How do you program it? How do I get my email? How do you get online? How do I set the password? How many have to get help hooking up to the internet? Hey, son, you come to church. Can you get me on the Wi-Fi? Huh? So we need that idealism and the energy. But here's also what we need. We need the wisdom and experience of the older generation. And we must work side by side. But there's a statement I've always said, and I've said this for years. Because culture changes and we grow old, we always have to honor what people have done, but we always have to lean young and train the next generation. Because they're the ones that are going to carry this for the next 20, 30 years or until Jesus comes back. So it's interesting because now, you know, some people still come to church and they see the lights and the smoke and all of that. And like, oh my gosh, I've never seen that. You know, there's still churches that fight that today and they're dying. Here's the thing. Is Jesus getting exalted? The method is a method. But we still sing old songs. We still sing new songs. Because you honor, but you also have to reach the younger generation. And that's what the Bible's always taught, and that's what King David taught, and that's what he was so, 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 his heart was about, that we'll get to in just a second. But Satan's goal is for us to dis- get us to despise our differences. He wants the old not to want to work with the young, and he wants the young not to work with the old. He doesn't want different cultures and races, just the way he's done it. You know, when we talk about our value again, when it says ethnic background, marital status, age, welcome here, it was really interesting, it's really funny because, you know, we believe personally that you shouldn't live together before you're married. That is a person, that is a a biblical standard that has always been, that you should wait until you're married to live together. But if I would ask for a show of hands here right now, and I'm not going to, how many people are living together, you would probably be as shocked, astonished. But that's a sin according to Bible. And then you get the church out there fighting. See, the church world has only heard what the church is against, not what we're for. I want people to know what we're for. We're for health and wholeness. We want restoration in families. But we'll fight about homosexuality, but then we'll ignore the same truth when it comes to living together. So six years ago, I've had three couples come up to me today. And I'm, I'm you know, I just love this. I got an inbox on Facebook because one couple has moved away, and then I've had two couples already come up to me today, and they said, you know, Pastor, this weekend six years ago, remember we did the I Do weekend. And what I did is I taught a message on this subject, and I said, if you are living together and you want to get married, I'm going to marry you. I want to marry you. Listen, if you're already living together and you have kids, let's just get it right. If you know you've been living together, come on. Why fight and, you know, people like get kicked out of churches because of it. How about let's bring people on a path of God. Let them make their own decisions. And so we did. We're like, hey, you know what? We're going to do in a couple weeks, we're going to do an I do weekend. We provided all the cake. We provided the whole atmosphere for it. Was it 12 couples? How many... We had 12 couples that weekend get married, come down and make a stand, and they got married. I just love God. He's so cool. But we can turn things into something it's not. Just think of some of these things this younger generation has done. See, We have to understand this. What is the potential of every church member? What's their potential? Because everyone in this room has potential of contributing something. 
See, it's the age of a person, it isn't as important as the quality of a person. And we're going to start getting our teenagers serving alongside of you. Because this is their church too. They love their church. And if you have a teenager, have them in the back during second service. But look at the quality. Think of some of these people that uh, did some great things when they were young. Mozart, first piano concert, age six. That's not me. Age seven, Helen, Helen Keller mastered the vocabulary of 625 words. Age 10, Thomas Edison set up a laboratory in his basement. Louis Braille, at age 15, started the Braille system. David, in the Bible, assumed kingship at 15. Well, he was anointed to be king at 15. Einstein wrote his first documents about theory of relativity when he was 16. Definitely not me. Joan of Arc led 3,000 soldiers at the age of 17 to victory. At 19, Bill Gates co-founded Microsoft. William Pitt II became Prime Minister of Great Britain at 24. Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum. At age 59, Clara Barton founds the American Red Cross. At age 65, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't even love Kentucky Fried Chicken. Come on, be honest. Every hand should go up. I mean, there's nothing more American than apple pie and Kentucky Fried Chicken and baseball. Come on. Winston Churchill, prime minister at 65. Michael Angelo designed the dome of the St. Peter's Basilica at 72. Benjamin Franklin at 79 invented bifocals. Some of you remember this guy, George Burns. Won his first Academy Award at 80. That's awesome. John Wesley, listen to this, the founder of the Methodists. This was out of a, a, um, his diary or... He says, John Methodist became annoyed when at the age of 83, he could not write more than 15 hours a day without his eyes hurting. <laughs> at 68, I mean, sorry, at 86, he was ashamed he could not preach more than twice a day. And he complained in his diary that there was an increasing tendency to lie in bed until 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> Some of you that you just... You're like, I can't remember the last time I woke up at 5.30. How about this? Michelangelo also was still composing poetry and designing structures at 89. And he painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel on his back on scaffold when he was near 90. And Grandma Moses was still painting at 100. And I like this last one because of the quote. Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice who retired at 91, said, men do not quit playing because they grow old. They grow old because they quit playing. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to have a little more fun in life. <laughs> Amen. That's why next month, next week, when the Vikings play Miami, I'm buying you all tickets to Miami to, for, to watch my Vikings play. Some of you are like, that ain't fun. Yes, it is. Come on. <laughs> every culture, every face, every race, every age needs to be a part at this church for us to reach the world. We have to learn to work together. We have to honor each other's strengths, work with each other's weaknesses. That's what God's calling us to do. And King David understood these two things. God was with him when he was young, and, that he, and now that he was old, he had a responsibility to the next generation. That's what he understood. You want to add anything? I want my wife to come up. Now, if you're new here, my wife and I have been in ministry for over 25 years together, and we work together as a team. And so when I ask her to come up, I don't ever want you to stop and think, Pastor forgot what he was going to say. His wife's there to help him out. No. It's just, she'll, I can just kind of tell sometimes she's sitting down there and she's just like, you know, there's something that I want to do or share. And so, honey, it's yours.
you know, it, it's so true how um, when we all work together, different races, different backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, different ages, it doesn't matter. When we all work together, that's, and, and biblically, that's when we really see amazing, powerful things happen. The Bible says that one can put a thousand to flight and two puts 10,000 to flight. So you see a multiplication in effectiveness when people join together. And so I just want you to do something for me. I, I'm going to count to three, and I want everyone out loud, and please do this, everyone. You'll, you'll understand the point. Loud as you can. Um, when I count to three, I want you to say your name out loud, okay? So I'll go one, two, three, and you'll say it. One, two, three. Marcia! Okay. That was a mess. <laughs> I couldn't pick out one of your names, but that's okay. Now, now I could hear somebody said Michael down here. So, on the count somewhere. of three, I want us all to say Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus! When we are all unified, one heart, one mind, one goal to lift up Jesus, we have a voice. We have a voice that can be heard in our homes, in our city, right. in this world. And that's why all of us together can do incredible things for the body of Christ, in the body of Christ. But when we're all disjointed and separated and everyone's saying their own thing, our effectiveness is, goes from here down to here. So let's just remember, we are here to lift up Jesus. And as we do that together, he will be heard. His message will be heard. And all men, the Bible says, will be drawn unto him. Amen. Amen. That's why this series is on culture is so important, on core, our core values. Because that's the glue that holds us together. No one's going to ever agree with methods. Just never going to happen. But this is who we are. These are our values. And so as we go through this, and, 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 and Dr. Steve, what was that quote you said? It, it's similar to what I'm saying, but I like the way you said it. Methods are many, Methods are many but, principles are few. but principles are few. And in the Bible, Jesus is, God is right, Amen. And that's what we're always going to stick to. And so as we close, this is what King David understood about the young and then his responsibility to the next generation. I'm thinking about it. I'm 52. I don't plan to retire. I feel, you know, I got 20 good years left, and then I still won't stop. But I realize for the effectiveness of the church and the vision and the value of the next generation that, you know, in these next five, ten years, I have, we have to train and develop the younger people while they're here. Get them ready to do better than what we did. Amen. Amen. That's why we need the wisdom of the old. But when it comes time, we have to step back and be there and let them run it. But we're still there to help them in their mistakes. Amen. And that's why it's so, so important we work together. And David said in Psalm 71, he said for, for, and David's texting somebody right now too. For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually for you. Now look at verse 9 of 71. Do not cast me off in time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. Verse 17. O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. Your power to everyone who is to come. See, King David understood that he needed his strength and his wisdom 
to develop and to train the next generation. But he also honored God in, when he was young. And then Psalms 145, verse 4 and 13. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I, I, I know the gentleman won't care who I'm going to give this story to, but after first service, this gentleman that had... It was interesting uh, because, you know, we believe in healing. And this gentleman had a really severe, severe back issue. And he went in for, for surgery and wasn't, he was, just said, will you pray and agree with us for it to go well? Well, he went in for surgery and it was something that could, you know, this situation could have pretty much put him in a wheelchair. He went in the surgery just miraculously came through it. And within days, he, 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 he came to us like, man, I walked five miles. And, you know, within like just, when I say days, maybe it was a week or what, but it was still miraculous. And so I saw him today, and I saw he, he, he looked like he was very uncomfortable. And, um, and I'm like, hey, it's good to see you. And he's like, yeah. He goes, I brought a friend today. And I'm like, oh, really? I, I go, who? He goes, a kidney stone. <laughs> He goes, but it's the last day of growth track, and I'm not missing it. And he came, and he went to growth track. And I'm like, that's awesome. But, you know, he would be considered my age and older. But to see that dedication and that commitment and that heart to serve Jesus Christ, it really blessed me. It really blessed me. And now I'm going to end with my story about Guatemala and why this all matters. I want to show you a picture. You guys want to put that picture up? You know, my wife and I had the privilege you know, of going to Guatemala and preaching to almost 600 Bible school students. And this is the same group that does the shoe boxes. My wife and I did five, you know, the whole time we were there, we preached 16 times, uh, ministered. At night, we had services. We did... I did a series on freedom. And at night they had praise and worship because it was in the church. And there was a young man, probably around 20, and he was autistic. Um, something like that was going on in his life. And he just would run in front of everybody and jump around and get almost up on the stage. And, but it was just a true genuineness that the music moved this young man. And, you know, and you would sit... You know, and it, 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 at the, it would bring you a smile, but it would hurt your heart at the same time to see it. And so I taught my message on freedom. Well, Sunday, preached three services on Sunday, and the last one, this older lady came up to me, and she said, Pastor, she said, thank you for coming to Guatemala and teaching your message on freedom. She said, because the young man running around is my son, and she said, I am done. I don't know what to do anymore with him, and I can't handle it anymore, and I'm done. And she said, and you taught your message on freedom, because I talked about my, the time when I went through depression, and uh, I sure wasn't at my best during that time, and I talked how God restored and how I went and got help through a doctor, because she go, I because I was praying and praying and confessing, and it wasn't changing. And she said this. She goes, I've been praying and praying. I've been taught prayer, prayer, confession. confession. Nothing was happening. But she goes, you came, and you said, go get help. She goes, I went. She said, thank you for giving me permission to go get help. I went and got help. She had been on medicine just a few days. She goes, I'm already better and can handle my son. Thank you. That is why we do what we do, everybody is to see that happen. I was talking with Jim down beforehand because he's gone to Guatemala and he's been there. And the testimonies that you have when you go overseas and helping people and you hear stuff like that, everything we do is worth it for that. That's why you're giving your involvement. You'll, some of you will never go to Guatemala. Some of you will next year. But because of your faithfulness, those Bible school students are going to 11 different countries. They're going to take the message of hope and help 
and they're gonna change the world and you had a part to play in that. So I wanna say thank you to you guys. Let's, amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message today. Help us to realize that even though there's many generations represented here, we all have a part to play. We all have a purpose. And Lord, that you want all of us to use the giftings we have to reach the city for you. So I thank you for those that are here today. I ask your blessings upon them as they leave. Protect them. Give them wisdom and strength if they're struggling in situations with their kids or in their marriages. Lord, show them the answers in your word. And as we can, in, in the Bible, help them to see what they need to see. And Lord, we put our trust in you today. Give us hope and help and healing in Jesus' name. Amen.